as I share this passage with you, it's, it's on my heart to share. Um, uh, and then we'll have, we have some folks that, that have called ahead and, and they want to be baptized. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. We're 150 or 40. I don't know where we're at. We're a bunch of people. There's a lot of folks in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's a couple of things I want to share that I think are appropriate for tonight. Um, and there's some, and it, it kind of ties, in, I think it does tie into the scriptures here. This passage that this has been on my mind that I've been wanting to share. Um, so uh, the, the, the one verse I want to really have us focus on in a moment, not yet, but in a moment, it will be on the screen for us. But um, I just, well, you know, um, God, he, he's, he's so aggressive. He's so active. Now, listen, I know sometimes the enemy tries to convince us that he's forgotten us, that God's forgotten us. The enemy tries to convince us that there's no hope, that it's, you know, this, whatever, for lost loved ones, for sicknesses in our body, for issues that we're dealing with, whatever situations we find ourselves in. I mean, obviously, the, the thing that he does. But the point is, is that, that God, even, even when the devil has been at his most intense throughout the history of mankind, God, he didn't get shook up over it. He always had a plan. He always had a strategy, right? I mean, even, and we're going we're gonna to get to the guard, the first, we're going to talk about two different gardens tonight. But even in the, the first garden, <clears throat> when everything just fell apart, God's like, all right. And then right away, right away, he told the devil, the very woman, you've heard me say this before, the very woman that you deceived, I'm going to have a seed come from her. <laughs> You're going to bruise his heel. It's going to look like you've won, but he's going to crush your head. I'm just letting you know that. Now, this is like over 4,000 years later this is going to happen, but I'll tell you now, God's saying to the devil, I'll go ahead and tell you now. There's a seed that's going to come from her, and you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. See, I can tell you that ahead of time because there's nothing you're going to be able to do to stop it because that's what I'm going to do. Does this make sense? You see what I'm saying? And so God is so aggressive. He's so active. He's so involved. You know, we started these these uh, the, these services, these 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 special moments, these times, and just seeking God and and pressing in and and um, and then we've seen God do much more than what we anticipated. This was supposed to go just you know starting July 11th on that Wednesday and then end on August 1st. That's what our plan was, and then God obviously had another plan, and we were at least by His grace were able to somehow figure that out and <laughs> follow His plan. You know. Um, and uh, we've seen so much happen in people's lives. Now, in many ways, in many ways, I'll say this to you guys, the Friday night crowd. I'm not say it. I'll say it Sunday too, I guess. But in many ways, uh, we're we're not going to be the same. We'll never be the same church again. Our worship team will never be the same worship team again. Our, our staff's never going to, we're not going to be the same staff again. I mean, we're just not, I'll tell you one thing, we're never going to, we won't ever go back to the goofy little cellophane communion cups. That's never going to happen again. I almost, I almost feel like we got delivered from that. I mean, that was just like, almost felt like the children of Israel coming out of Egypt on that one. And the problem is that was my idea. So, (laughs) So you have those ideas, and you're like, what was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. It seemed like a good idea at the time. But I'll tell you what, communion means more to me, and I think it means more to you than it, than it ever has in my life, and probably for many of you, right? And here's the thing. Like, uh, you know, Ryan grew up Episcopalian. I grew up, my parents went to Lutheran Church when I was little, and then we went to the United Methodist Church. And I'm not saying all United Methodist churches are this way. But the one we went to was very uh, what they call liturgical. There was a lot of liturgy. There was a lot of f- formalism and 
the pulpit was on one side and they had a lectern on the other side and there was a lot of incense and there was a lot of, and you, you got, there was a, it was a lot of calisthenics. You were up and down a lot, up and down a lot. I know some of you have been to the Catholic Church the same way. You get a lot of exercise, you, you know, and you kind of figure out when to go down, you know. Um, and so sometimes, and you receive communion every, every, every service, you know, and sometimes it just becomes, you just kind of lose the idea of what it's all about. I feel like the Lord's really opened up to us even more so what it means to worship at his table and what we can expect to receive when we worship at his table. And I want to encourage you, again, I know I've said it several times, but I want to encourage you to figure out some way. If you don't want to go to Mardell's and buy a little communion set, create your own little communion, whatever. Get some pita bread. You can buy, I don't know, I think we got that at HEB, I'm not sure. But but get something and, and worship Worship the Lord at his table. Do it at home. You don't have to do it every day. Just do it as the Lord puts it on your heart to do it. But, well, I mean, what we've changed. That was what I'm trying to say. I'm getting sidetracked. We've changed. God's doing some, uh, has done some incredible things for us. And it all started with us saying and me saying, you know, God has done some great things for us. He's really blessed New Life Church. It, and he always has in our 63, 64 year history. And as me as a senior pastor of the last seven years, he's blessed us in a remarkable way. And we've seen a lot of people added to the New Life Church family. And we've seen a lot of powerful things happen in people's lives. But there was just this increased hunger uh, in all of us and this increased hunger in me. I wanted, I felt like we as a church. I felt like there was more of God that we could experience, and I felt like we needed more because our world is just getting crazier and crazier. And I just realized that church, I said this before, I'm going to say it again, but church as is, even a better version of as is, isn't going to get the job done. We need God's manifested presence in our lives and in our churches. And then I was reading in Revelation about a year and a half ago, and this just kept clinging to me. The staff knows this, about where Jesus talks about how Jesus walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The candlesticks represent the seven churches of Asia, which really represent the churches, Jesus being the head of the church. And it dawned on me, Jesus, every Sunday or every time we meet, is walking up and down our aisles. He's never filled out a, a, a visitor card. But he's walking up and down the aisles of our churches every time we come together. And he has an opinion about what we're doing. And there's probably stuff he likes. And there's probably other stuff he's like, ah, I think you need to delete that. Now, what, not one time when he went to the seven churches and said, I love this about what you're all doing. But I need you to stop doing this. And I need you to start doing this because you're not doing it. And so I realized, wow, Jesus is telling us what he's looking for when he's walking up and down the aisles of our churches. And he's looking for people who are surrendered. He's looking for people who are hungry. He's looking for people who are willing to be obedient. He's willing to, he's looking for people who are, will stop measuring themselves and stop holding back a part of their lives and just absolutely, just completely give themselves completely to him. He's looking for people who are willing to persevere. He's willing, he's looking for people who are willing to stand up for the truth. He's looking for people who are willing to walk the truth. He's just, that, this is what he's looking for, right? And I noticed not one of those churches did he pull out an attendance chart and say, well, you know, you should have this many in church and you only have this many. I'm I have a problem with that. He didn't do that. If he had a problem, it had nothing to do with how many people were in his church, in those churches. If he had a problem, it had to do with where their hearts were. To the church at Ephesus, he says, you've lost your, you've forsaken your first love. You're not nearly as on fire and, and just full of God like you used to be. You used to love me a lot more passionately than you do now. And I need you to go back and start doing what you did the first time you fell in love with me and you thought you were going to lose your mind because you just wanted to live in my presence and read my word and tell people about me. Right, everybody? You see what I'm saying? And so we walked into this thinking, man, we don't want to... Man, we want Jesus to walk him down the aisles of New Life Church and go, 
I like it here. I think I feel at home here because I'm being lifted up and the Spirit of God has liberty and freedom. Come on, somebody. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? And I, I know that God is doing this not just here at New Life Church. It's, it's not unique with us. Um, you know, some of you saw that uh, there was a, there's a magazine uh, and they have a, a, a news site that's a part of their organization called Charisma News. And there's a magazine called Charisma Magazine. and They've been around forever. Um, and, and so some of you know that they, the Charisma News did a little blurb story about what's been happening here. And then today I taught, and, and the reason why I'm sharing this is I want you to understand that this is not about New Life Church. So I, play, I, 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 I made up my mind I wasn't going to say this to anybody, to you guys, but, but it kind of, but, but I'm mentioning it because it fits into just all of what I think that I want to share this, this tonight. And so they did that little story and, and, um, about what God's been doing here at, in Corpus Christi, Texas. And so, um, uh, and so then they contacted us, and I, I had an interview this afternoon with, they're actually going to be doing an, a, a story about, and they're select, they, they, uh, it's more than three churches, but they're selecting three churches that they've heard about. And we're one of those three, and they're going to be doing a, a, like a full-length story in their magazine in November. Now, the reason why I mention that is not, not because, hey, look at us. Aren't we cool? We're going to be in that, that, whole, that story or whatever. It's that we're one of three. And honestly, we're, there's more than that. I'm telling you, there's more than that. So my point in saying this is not to highlight new life. Aren't we cool that there, you know, somebody is noticing what God's doing here? My point in that is that the article they said is about these different churches that are experiencing. There's a church in Georgia that will be in this article. And they started having these crazy Sunday night services now watch this, where people, hundreds of people, are getting baptized. Just like here. I had no idea. I didn't know about it until it started happening here. And so it's been going on and on. It's just been going, and it's been, it's been powerful. Uh, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a military base in, uh, in, in Missouri, and in the last 18 months, they've seen, how many? Last five months, I'm sorry, in the last five months, they've seen 1,800 soldiers come to Christ. The chaplain, the chaplain said he has never seen that. The chaplain said he has never seen that. He's never seen anything like that. Like, what's going on? I'm telling you what's happening. Jesus, listen, here's the thing. We can pray all day long through a month of Sundays. We can keep praying for God to show us more and give us more. But if we really want to see more, we got to give him room to show us more. We got to give him more if we want. Does that make sense, everybody? And so what's happening is he's, God's speaking to these different churches, and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll, and they're kind of, saying the same thing I'm saying, and I didn't even know that they were saying the same thing. We're going to give them more, more room. I spoke on the phone for about 45, for about 45 minutes with Pastor Rick Bezet, uh, the senior pastor of, of New Life Church in Arkansas. He's been here uh, several times. We have a very close relationship with that church. Um, they've been a huge blessing to us. Um, if you were here last time he spoke, it's always powerful. He is coming back, not this year, but next year he's coming back on a Wednesday night. But I was talking with him and just kind of sharing with him what's happening here. And he, he told me, he said, look, man, we're pressing in for the same thing. And they've act, they're actually looking at adjusting one of their services. They have multiple services because they have about 15,000 people that come on a weekend. And they've got about how many campuses? It's like 15 15 or 16 different campuses and so he says he says we just got too regimented and so he says we're changing up some things I go, why so we can give God some more room wow okay that's what we've been 
You see what I'm, here's what I'm trying to say is that this, I want us to see what's happening here is the heart and mind and will of God for America, for the world. There needs to be a final harvest before Jesus comes back, see. There needs to be another awakening. In man's history, we've had the first great awakening. We've had the second great awakening. We've had some great revivals in between those times. But I think God's looking for a third great awakening that will grip the entire planet and will plunder hell like crazy and populate heaven. I'm convinced that's what He wants. And those who have ears to hear can experience it. Because what we've seen in all of this is you don't have to be I mean, Jacob, man, wrestled with God. Jacob's a great example that you don't have to be perfect to experience God's presence. Jacob was a liar, a cheater. I mean, he was a horrible, horrible guy. One day he just surrendered, though, and he experienced the power of God. Does this make sense, everybody? And so it's just that it's the invitation is there. So all of this stuff's happening. It's so odd, and I did not know this until I thought, well, I better call some of my buddies and let them know what's going on. Of course, now some of them are seeing it anyway. They're seeing it on our Facebook page, and they're, you know, and we're getting calls from different people. I'm getting calls from different people from different parts of the country. What's going on? What's going on? We want that here. We want that here. My my response is, can we have that here? My response is, can you can you sing? Can you pray? And can you give them some time? Because if you can pray and you can sing and give them some time, you probably could have that here there. That was a good statement right there. That was like quotable, tweetable, Facebook postable, Instagrammable, whatever. I don't know. And so then today, then today, Pastor Bob Yandian calls, and you know, he comes every year here and he just teaches. He's such a teacher, and he was here last June. Yeah, he was here in June. Do y'all know who I'm talking about? Pastor Bob, little guy, little Arminian guy. But he just knows the Bible like crazy, right? Isn't he a wonderful Bible teacher? And he loves this church. This is his favorite place. And so he just called me today and he said, hey, I just, and I, and I thought maybe he was calling because he saw the article or he heard or whatever. And so I said, oh, uh, he said, how's it going? I said, great. And, I, and so I wanted to wait and see why he called. Well, he was just calling to let us know that his guy was going to call to schedule him back for next year, which we, of course, always love to do that. And so in the meantime, you know, he's asked me, how, how's, how, how are you doing? Like personally, I'm doing great, Pastor Bob. And he says, how's Bonnie doing? They usually ask that first, actually. Because I think they like Bonnie more than they do me. And uh, I know Nikki does. Yeah. And so, because he's told me he does. <laughs> likes her. But, um, but Bonnie used to be his assistant, you know, his executive assistant. So he, he likes Bonnie. And so he asked me how Bonnie is. And he asked me how Malachi was. No, he didn't ask me that. My dog, Malachi, our dog. That was a bad joke. Okay. So I began to share with him what God was doing here. Uh, I talked with Brady Boyd after one of the services. He's one of our overseers. Pastor Brady comes. He didn't come this year. He'll be back again next year. But he comes every year, and he's our pastor, really. And, and he is our pastor, Bonnie and I's pastor. And he's incredible. And he pastors New Life Church in Colorado Springs. And I, one night I shared with him what was happening, and he was tickled. He just thought that was phenomenal. I'm, I'm so happy man, this is awesome. He was excited. And so I'm talking to Pastor Bob today, and I was telling him what's been happening in our services. And Pastor Bob is on Joyce Meyer's board. Okay? So she has a few board members, and he's one of those. And so from time to time, he's in meetings with her, her meetings. And so I'm telling him everything that's happened, and he said, Mike, this is happening all over the country. He said, I was just in a meeting with Joyce. 25,000 women. And you know how there have been times in our evenings here where the guy, the, these guys stopped singing and you guys just kept going, no, we're not done with that song. And you just guys kept singing. And then it was just like the Spirit of God just kind of started hovering, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And just the power of God and just broke out throughout. The, he said, he said, that's exactly what happened at this meeting he was just at with Joyce. 
And he says, and think about it happening with 25,000 women where all of a sudden during worship, they just took off and began to pray and began to cry out to God and began to sing. And the rest of the people are like not singing. They're just watching these women just kind of take over. I love it when you take over, by the way. And they just, you know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Yes or no? It's my point in saying all of that is this is happening everywhere. God. God's not through with us. He's not through with this nation. He's not through with the churches. And those who are willing to give him more, he will come. He want, he's coming. He is coming. And I don't mean he's, I know he's coming like the second coming. I understand that. I'm saying before that, he is coming again. He will manifest himself. All right. Now, in John chapter 14, he says, and he who loves me, will be loved by my Father, watch this, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to preach right now. Jesus, I'm, I'm going to preach. Jesus walking into the room. So how many times have we talked about in these seven weeks, there's the omnipresence of God, there's the ever-presence of God, and then there's the manifested presence of God. The manifested presence of God is what we need. Does that mean he wasn't there and he finally showed up? Like, yeah, God went, he vacationed somewhere in Cabo. He decided to come back to Corpus and help us out. No. When we say the manifested presence, he was always here. We just weren't aware of it. He made himself known because we gave him the opportunity to make himself known. And when he makes himself known, there's something that happens supernaturally in our lives, our marriages, our homes, our children. Listen to me. There's something supernatural that happens in our prayers when he makes himself known when he walks in the room does that make sense everybody all right so let me go ahead are you all ready to get into this okay i'm gonna go ahead and preach you guys don't have to play i'm gonna preach but don't go anywhere okay so here's what i want to say about this this whole idea of god's presence and i'll make this quick because i want to get right into the next thing that we need to do and the baptisms but I told you I wanted to talk about two gardens tonight. The first garden we know is the garden of paradise where Adam and Eve lived for a season, for a moment in time. And in the first garden, talking about the presence of God, in the first garden, God's presence was taken for granted. He would come down in the cool of the day and he would walk with them. And his presence was taken for granted. They disobeyed. He told them not to eat of that fruit. They ate that fruit. They, we know they spiritually died. Their eyes were open to the difference between good and evil. And you say, well, is that bad? Yeah, because all God wanted them to be aware of was good. And the presence of God lifted off of them. I've talked to you about this before. That's why they felt naked. It wasn't the absence of clothing. Clothing. It was the absence of God's presence. That's what they were clothed with. But they took it for granted. And after that tragic situation that took place, and we know God's plan immediately was set into place to redeem man back to himself. But after that tragedy in, the, in that first garden, that was the last time that we hear of God or even in the scripture see God walking in the garden with man. The last time. Well, at least not for another 4,000 plus years. Because then there was a second garden. In John chapter 19, verse 41, it says, Now in the place where he was crucified... There was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And in this second garden, here's what we see. Mary, the news of the tomb being empty has already gone out. It's already been discovered, and in in, in this passage of Scripture in John 20, it says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, 
she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She's weeping. The body of the Lord, the only thing left of him is gone. And she saw two angels sitting there, one that should have been the head of Jesus and one should, what should have been the feet of Jesus. He's not there, though. And they're just those two angels are sitting there where the body used to lay. And then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, because they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they've laid him. He's gone. Something had been stolen from her. Now listen to me. She had lost in her mind. She felt like she had lost God's presence. Just like some of you at times feel like you've lost his presence. He's a million miles away. He's gone. He's MIA. He's absent. I can't feel him. I can't sense him. I can't hear him. I don't know where he went. And she wept. I know some of you feel that, have experienced that as well. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. I don't want that to ever happen to me, right? I don't want that to happen to you, right, where we're looking for him. We need him. We've been wanting him. We've been missing him. We've wondered where he's been, and he's right there, but we don't recognize him. We don't see him. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Who are you looking for? She, she, supposing him to be the gardener in this second garden, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, <laughs> will you please tell me where you've laid him so I can carry, take his body and I can carry it and feel it and be near it one more time? In the next verse, Jesus said to her, Mary... <laughs> and it was just the way he said it. It was the way he said her name, see. Suddenly she recognized his voice. She had heard him say his name so many times when he was alive. And he said her name and something just, the lights went off inside of her. And she recognized who it was. And she turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is translated teacher. She, he was always there. But suddenly she was aware of him. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? Suddenly she was aware of him. He was there, but suddenly she was aware of him. He whispered her, her name, and that, that, that triggered something that opened her eyes. She realized, listen, Jesus, I'm telling you tonight, Jesus is in this house. He's in this place. He's saying your name. He's whispering your name. He is here, and he wants to manifest himself. He wants to show himself to be strong. He wants to show himself to be forgiving and loving and courageous and comforting. He's here. He's, some of you, he's saying your name. Now, the next verse, it says in verse 17, she says, teacher, we don't know what happened. At, well, we kind of do know what happened after that. We know based on what Jesus said. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. That wasn't a rebuke. That was a promise. Do not cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to my Father. He had told them over and over again, when I come, when I come back from the dead and I ascend to the Father, then I'm going to send Him, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And He'll not only be with you, but He will be in you. And you'll never have to look for Him or search for Him or feel alone or feel abandoned. He even said, I will not leave you as orphans. Right? That wasn't a correction. Stop it. He just said, no, you can't do that now. 
Because I'm eventually going to ascend into heaven. It's not going to help. It's not going to ultimately be what you need anyway. But here's the thing I want us to see. That, that, that was a promise. That wasn't a correction. It was a promise. I haven't ascended to my father. But when I do, Mary, ooh, you can cling all you want, girl. Here's the thing I want you to see. In the first garden, God's presence was taken for granted. In the second garden, Mary wasn't going to make that same mistake. And even though Jesus had to say, don't cling to me, the moment she recognized it was him, the first thing she did was grab a hold of him for dear life. She grabbed a hold of his presence. That's what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen. You can pray for a month of Sundays. But let's grab a hold of it. Let's recognize it. Let's yield. Come on, let's yield to it. Let's surrender to it. Because everything we need is found in His presence. Even the psalmist said that in your presence is the fullness of joy and pleasures at your right hand forevermore. It's in His presence that we discover who we are. It's in His presence that we experience His healing. It's, listen to me. It's in His presence that we find hope. It's in His presence that our hearts are quickened. It's in His presence that our faith is made alive and active again. It's in His presence that we're full of joy. It's in His presence that we find the strength to go on. It's in His presence that we find the courage to stand, right? It's in His presence that we experience that but we can't be passive about it for some of you he's speaking your name Mary John Bob I don't I'm just making up names Tiffany Shaniqua I don't know Olive Deborah and he's saying listen to me he's saying our name and he's here. And he's in this place. And it's his, and let's not make the same mistake Adam and Eve made where they took it for granted until they lost it. Let's be like Mary. Oh, he's here? That's him. Mm, you're not going anywhere. And now we can do that without correction. We can do that without Jesus saying, don't cling to me because it's his spirit. It's his presence that's here on this earth. And we need to cling to him. Amen. Because he's clinging to you. He's clinging to you. Let's stand to our feet if we can right now. I'm going to ask the worship team to just begin to, to get prepared, lead us as we just respond to him. Now, at this point in time, as they begin to sing, if you want to go... Uh, if you want to worship at his table, you're welcome to do that. If you're here to be baptized, I want those folks to get ready and make their way t towards the back and towards the baptism, towards the tank here, the, the, the horse trough. As they begin to sing, that's your cue. You can begin to worship him. at. But la ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. This is also... Don't you dare leave this place. And I'm not saying that like I'm upset with you. I'm saying that just with the love of God, don't you dare leave this place. <laughs> you know, when he was raised from the dead, he appeared. And there were still some that doubted. I don't want to be that guy. He's whispering some names tonight. He's reminding you that he's here. He's making himself known. Cling to him tonight. I'm asking you to cling to him tonight. And if it helps you to come down to this, to the front of this stage and create an altar as you kneel, if that's what helps you to cling to him, if that's what you need to experience, to lock into his presence tonight and receive exactly what you need, some of you need healing tonight. Some of you need forgiveness. Some of you here tonight need to know that you're forgiven. You've cried out for it, but you're not sure you are forgiven. You know in your head you're supposed to be forgiven, but you've not experienced the joy of forgiveness. He has forgiven you. 
you may need to come down here so you can actually receive forgiveness receive joy receive hope receive courage receive his love like never before tonight my goodness he's here spirit of god we recognize you in this place wind of god blow through this house right now in the name of jesus come on let's sing it together let's worship him come on respond to him cling to him tonight